23rd yes. meeting of the Board of Selectmen, <laughs> and if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So we always start with public audience, and I'd like to see if there's anyone in the room tonight um, that's here to give public audience. We do have someone online, but I'm gonna give um, reference to the people that are here in person. Lori, if you could state your name, address, and also we will cut you off at five minutes. Yeah, I don't have that much. Hi, I'm Lori Boyko. I live at 15 Oakhurst Road. <clears throat> I just had a couple of quick points. Um, one is that at the last selectmen's meeting, it, before the selectmen's meeting, there was a um, joint meeting with the police commissioner's board and the selectmen. And for whatever reason, that was not updated on the website because I was intending to come to the regular police commissioner's meeting. And that, and I checked it on the way over here and it was telling me that it was upstairs at uh, five o'clock, which is why I arrived at five o'clock. And when I went upstairs, there was nobody up there. So I wandered down here, anticipating coming to the selectmen's meeting. So I'm just making that point. I don't know how the meeting changes get notified out to people. Um, I don't know what the rules are about posting it or who's responsible for it, but it may go out in an email, but maybe not get updated on the website or something. But I just wanted to make that point so people knew that Anybody that might be showing up and not on an email list might not be aware of last minute changes. Um, I also wanted to make a comment that um, was really in response to Sean's comment at the last selectmen's meeting that he wished more people cared about the opioid crisis and other drug crises as much as they care about the marijuana issue. And since public audience is only at the beginning, I didn't get a chance to share my thoughts on that. Um, I know I care very much about the opioid crisis as well as many other drugs that people throughout this country are addicted to. Um, I happen to come here and speak about the marijuana issue because that's what is before us. Um, but not only do I care about it, I I've know a lot about it um, more than I would like to. I, I know a lot of people that I care about, friends who um, are unfortunately under the thumb of those addictions. Um, I, I also wanna say something that I've been learning lately is that we're encouraged to label our kids, boys especially, with ADD and other issues and get them a prescription for Adderall, which is an addictive amphetamine. I understand that there are some people that need it and I am not a doctor and I am not about to tell anybody's family what they should be doing, but we normalize it and other prescriptions that are controlled substances. Then we send them off to college where its sale and use is rampant along with Xanax and other things. Kids are selling them to each other on college campuses and deciding they have ADHD and deciding that if they take this, they will study harder and get better grades. We keep statistics about how many are going to college from our schools. But we don't keep statistics, I don't know of any, about how many come home or drop out addicted to these substances we push to get them to comply in school and study and adhere and, and achieve credentials and improve themselves in the rat race. And we're really just normalizing the addiction. Um, I just wanted to share a quote by author James Baldwin who said, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. What role models do we want to be portraying for our children? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. 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 Uh, Dr. Rinaldi, I'll let you go and then I'll let Susan go. No, feel free. I'm still making my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I'm Mike Rinaldi. I reside at uh, Pinnacle Mountain Road. Uh, about uh, two months ago, I came here and um, <coughs> tried to inform you about the um, <coughs> marijuana problem. 
<clears throat> basically, I tried to distinguish between um, medical marijuana, marijuana for medical purposes, of which there is none, and marijuana for recreational purposes. Um, when I was here, uh, Mr. Peterson uh, gave me a great idea. He says, uh, I don't think Dr. Rinaldi uh, goes to any of the uh, zoning commission meetings. So I decided to go to some of them. Man, was that an eye opener. Those people have no idea what they're doing. There are six people there. Not one of them knew there was a difference between medical marijuana and marijuana for medical uses. Also, there was a text amendment being proposed by a Mr. McGregor, who I don't know, which was for locating uh, a re retail place for selling marijuana in Simsbury. I didn't think that was the Zoning Commission's job to <laughs> decide uh, whether we should have marijuana sold. That's a policy decision, and it's your decision, by the way. Um, Somehow, it got uh, approved to, to sell, I mean, to cultivate marijuana in Simsbury at the Ensign Bickford place. Um, it was a zoning problem of where to put it, but not to grow it here. I don't know how that decision was made. Uh, it was sort of uh, not well <coughs> promoted for the public to know about. But what I've came here to say tonight is, we've waited long enough for you people to decide. You've been given a couple of years. You should have been able to read up on it. I know a couple of you attend the meetings uh, with the uh, drug, drug dealers and drug cultivators. Um, but we're dealing with a drug that has really no use except to give you a high and um, for medical purposes, well, we have medical marijuana. It doesn't give you the high, but it does have treatment purposes in HIV and wasting disease and in um, treatment for anorexia due to chemotherapy pure drugs. But what we've done in Connecticut, as well as other states, is we made a bunch of doctors drug pushers. <laughs> it's a shame. Um, I have a federal and a state DA license to prescribe narcotics. Um, but I can't prescribe marijuana, nor can I prescribe heroin, nor pre can I prescribe LSD. Those are state, uh, Schedule I drugs that the um, Division of uh, Drug Enforcement says um, we can't grow them, we can't use them, we can't sell them, we can't prescribe them. That's federal law. State of Connecticut said something a little different. But the state of Connecticut, although I have a DA license here, I can't prescribe marijuana. You know who's going to be able to prescribe marijuana in this town? Some kid or person or a group of people <clears throat> who have um, been convicted of using marijuana and have been uh, disenfranchised, so to speak, the state of Connecticut is going to give them a license to distribute marijuana in places like Simsbury if we approve it. That's crazy. Now, the question is, somebody said, well, marijuana won't kill you. Um, how about water? Do you think water can kill you? Yep. Can. We don't allow it. <clears throat> there are anything you take to excess can kill you. You have 30 seconds left, Doctor. Okay. So I just want to give you a list of all the things that our doctors are prescribing mar marijuana for. How about chronic constipation? How about hair loss? How about priapism? How about sexual dis uh, uh, discomfort? I mean, there's a, there are 80 things on this list. And all that you have to do is go to the State Department of Licensure and get 20 people and say, I have 20 people with diarrhea, I'd like to treat them with uh, medical marijuana, and you'll get a permission. Thank you. It's time for you people to make the decision now. 
not a referendum. Thank you. You're you were elected to do that. So do it. Thank you. Susan Messina. Hi, good evening. Uh, Susan Messino, 41 Madison Lane. Nice to see all of you. Um, I'm here tonight both on behalf of myself and on behalf of Open Space and on behalf of the Grange. Um, so on behalf of myself, I'm going to just brag for a minute that the um, annual League of Conservation Voters Environmental Summit is tomorrow. Um, and you know, a lot of people have really noticed the work that we've been doing in Simsbury. And um, so I'm the lead person on the lead panel on forests and habitats. So I'm really thrilled to be um, able to advocate for some of the policies that we've put in place and, you know, share what we've been doing in Simsbury. And related to that, there is a bill in the legislature this session on old and old growth forests, which are only about 15 percent of the forests that we have are considered old over 100 years as, a, as just a cutoff. Um, and less than, far less than 1% would be considered old growth. So these are some of the most rare, um, like our seed corn, like things that we need to protect. Um, I also wanted to mention on behalf of Open Space, we've been working on some policies with Tom and Orlando on uh, mowing schedules, um, native plants. We've been talking about light pollution, um, and we have an opportunity to co-brand with the national organization, Homegrown National Park, which um, maybe some of you have heard about, which is basically saying, you know, if we sort of increase the ecology in our yards, it would be a huge, huge benefit all across the country. Um, so we've been talking with them, so that'll probably be coming before you at some point. I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Um, and the last thing, on behalf of the Grange, we are going to have an event. We have a few events coming up this year. The first one is on February 26th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon. We're having a seed giveaway and seed swap. So some people save seeds. Some people just want seeds. So you can come for free and get seeds. Um, and also we're having a Lego building activity. Um, where kids can make Lego stuff. So you can have your kids supervise, they can build a Lego thing, and you can get free seeds or swap seeds. Um, for the Lego building project, we're gonna encourage kids to make a 12 by 12 by 12 maximum size um, original Lego design, and then those can be entered into our fair in June, on June 10th, um, for cash prizes and ribbons. So I think that's it based on my scribbled notes and um, I, I want to say I care about mental health very much, and that's really a cornerstone of all the work that I do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and I have some little handouts. Okay. <clears throat> Should be three separate things, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. These are a couple of briefing papers. Sorry, a couple of briefing papers I helped to put together for the conference tomorrow and an information sheet on um, roadside trees. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else in the room um, here for public audience? Okay, we do have one person joining um, via Zoom. Um, so, um, yep, so we'll, Joan, you have five minutes. Thank you, Joan Cove, 26 Wisdom Drive. I'm very concerned that postings of the December 12, 2022 and the January 9, 2023 Board of Selected Meetings were removed from the Simsbury Pact. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I have rep uh, reposted them. This has not occurred in the past, and it seems unusual that at both these meetings I voiced my concerns about the positions of the board members relating to town manager Maria Capriola's job performance and contract renewal. I outed as selectman Eric Wellman's untruthful comments when questioned about his use of the Simsbury Meadows for a political rally and other untruthful comments, giving him several Pinocchios. How can, and I made a collage of the Pinocchios. Um, how can anyone trust uh, Pinocchio to establish policy for Simsbury? Eric Wellman's interaction with the Hartford Current reporter to drop what appeared to be misinformation to promote his narrative led to a retraction. Eric Wellman has touted on many occasions his past employment with NPR 
and his ability to use the media for his benefit. It appears that the Democrat members of the Board of Selectmen will be running for re-election. It is time that the members of the community place their names on the ballot to run against these deeply entrenched members of the Board of Selectmen who serve themselves, not the community. Both the Zoning Commission and Board of Selectmen have had the cannabis marijuana issue of deciding whether they will allow recreational cannabis marijuana in Simsbury. Elected members of the Zoning Commission and the Board of Selectmen are treating this political football by using every mechanism possible to not place their name on their vote. They are using mechanisms such as public hearings by passing the buck to the residents for cover as opposed to taking a vote. They are elected to represent the town and make tough decisions. On all campaign literature, all the candidates write about their protection of the character of Simsbury, but are willing to introduce a mind-altering drug into the community that will create many unintended consequences of mental health and public safety. After every meeting, I remind the Board of Selectmen that all my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch, Twitter at Jones. Oh, I also post on Twitter periodically. As the administrator of my Twitter account, I'm able to see how many people are viewing the postings. There have been between 100 and 600 plus views on the various postings. It appears that there is interest in my comments. So far, I have not had any postings deleted by Twitter with people who are uncomfortable with my comments. I recently reviewed the Simsbury Police Incident Statistics Report from December 1st to 31st, 2022 for family events, nonviolent, five incidents, family violence, violence events, four incidents. If you multiply by the nine incidents by 12, you have 108 incidents a year. These incidents are just not numbers, but families in stressful situations with many children being affected by the dysfunctional families. Many families are living in stressful situations, do not call the police, but ignore the issues facing them and their families in hopes that the issue would temporarily resolve itself. This is, un this is usually not the case. Mental health and addiction within the family unit are usually the underlying causes for stress and violence. Alcoholism has been attributed to many family offenses. There is mandated reporting for various issues. Why not mandatory committals? Mark Lebeckin, the owner of Redstone Pub, was arrested on 8-28-21 after the performing arts concert with many people in close proximity to the pub for allegedly discharging a gun in the air when under the influence with a 16-year-old son was arrested, uh, was present. The arrest the case was Nolly, 12-19-22. On 9-13-22, Mark Lebeckin was arrested for evading with property damage. The case was Nolly, 12-19-22. The Liquor Commission did an investigation on the 8-28-21 arrest and recommended that the Liquor Commission, be, uh, the liquor license be suspended. A negotiated settlement of a payment, a $1,500 settlement for, uh, for the case the 4-25-22. A lawsuit against the Redstone Pub for serving alcohol to a patron after leaving the pub was driving a car that resulted in an accident where she died. The lawsuit was filed 4 It appears that Mark Lebeckin has political influence that no other person with these charges would be given. Time, time, Can the state's attorney's office up, be corrupted John. by political influence? All my comments will be posted on Simsbury Pat and Twitter at Joan Poe. Thank you for listening. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the presentation portion of the program. I don't know why I said the program. Um, <laughs> um, so we have the Farmington Valley Health District here. Jennifer's here, and um, they've done a data analysis and collection. Maria, I don't know if you or Melissa wants it to do any sort of intro. Um, sure, thank you. Um, just a quick introduction of um, Jennifer and, and her team. Um, we're really glad that they could come this evening. Um, you may recall uh, back when they came to discuss their strategic plan right before the pandemic had happened, um, they started to talk about this project and they were starting to get efforts underway. Um, and then as we were emerging from the pandemic, they were able to regroup um, and continue their very good work on this project. And um, I had the privilege of, of hearing um, some of the preliminary findings at our Health District Board of Directors meeting and just was so impressed with 
of the work and thought it tied in so very nicely to a lot of the conversations we had, particularly during the budget process, about um, some of the changes that we were seeing in terms of mental health trends and things of that nature. Um, and this is also a very nice uh, tie-in to the work that the DEI Council is doing. Rick, I just want to acknowledge Rick Fresh is here. He's been terrific. Um, and he and Rebecca had have just been Oh, it's Rebecca. Yeah. Oh, hi. I <laughs> um, have just been really um, terrific assets as well as we're working on our um, our data project here in Simsbury. So with that, I will turn it over to the SEHD team. So are, are we going sure. out there? Okay. Yeah. Um, while they're, can I speak from right here? <laughs> yeah. Sure. So while they're um, going up, um, this was a, a really, they did an incredible job. Um, we condensed, you know, a huge report. You'll learn how to access it um into the 10 minutes um but there's a lot of common themes even among some of the public uh participants concerns around mental health etc we actually exchanged cards um uh, because we'll mo be moving into kind of a community health improvement process next um, but i'll turn it over to olivia and kirsten uh, to give the majority of the presentation thank you okay so what is a community health assessment? So big picture, it's a collaborative, systematic, data-driven report that describes the health status, behaviors, and outcomes of residents in the community. So by looking at various uh, health indicators that have associated data metrics with them, allowed us to better understand the health of the Farmington Valley. And now we're gonna move into uh, the community health improvement plan so we're gonna use this report as our basis, our groundwork for moving forward with that. So like I just said, this was a collaborative process. We convened an advisory board that included uh, subject matter experts uh, from within our community. Uh, so as you can see, these members were from uh, a vast array of uh, fields within public health. Uh, in particular from Simsbury, we had Kristen Formanek, from uh, social services, Rick Rush uh, from the DEI Council, and also Nancy Sheets from the Farmington Valley DNA. And they had many roles throughout this process, but I'm just gonna highlight one. Uh, they were involved in uh, deciding on the criteria for issue prioritization, because uh, as you can imagine, there are thousands of things we could have focused on within this report, so we needed to have a focus. So they were involved in that process. So some of the things that we uh, used as criteria were the magnitude of the problem. So how many people did it affect the seriousness of the consequence, whether it was actionable, whether there was prevention potential uh, criteria like that. So this is an overview of the topics uh, covered in the report. It is about an 80 page report. So this is the brief outline. Um, the vast majority of this data is broken down by age, gender, uh, income, and educational attainment. So that allowed us to look at disparities within subpopulations. So we started with demographics, so who lives in the Farmington Valley Health District. Then we moved into so social determinants of health. So those are conditions within the environment that people live, work, learn, play. Um, that affect their quality of life and their well-being, so ultimately affect their health. Uh, next, we moved into health behaviors. Um, we covered many things in this section, everything from how much physical activity people are getting, what substances they're using, cigarettes, alcohol, to vaccination screenings, you know, how many people got colonoscopies, mammograms, etc. cetera. Uh, we went into health outcomes. Everything from chronic disease, cancer, heart disease, overweight, obesity, infectious disease, you know, STIs, uh, foodborne illnesses. We had a big mental health section. Accidents includes uh, overdose data, uh, falls in the elderly population, and then finished with environmental health. And then we ended the whole thing with youth health, which looked at more or less the same indicators that I just covered, but in the 0 to 18 year old age group. And then this is just a brief overview of how of the data sources we used. Um, there was a lot. Uh, we uh, talked, had conversations with a lot of people uh, in uh, building this report. 
So now we're gonna be moving into the data piece of the report. Um, so as Livy mentioned, there were lots of different things to be looking at. Um, the advisory group helped us sort of sort, filter down into really the key findings. Um, the first three bullet points, I'm gonna go into more detail um, in the slides following these. And then I just wanted to just quickly talk about those other four. Um, we used one of our secondary one of our secondary data sources is called the Connecticut BRFSS, which is the Connecticut Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Um, and all of our data was pre-COVID. Um, and we did that intentionally so as not to be like, oh, well, that's probably because of COVID. That's because of COVID. So everything you're going to see here is pre-COVID numbers, or most everything you're going to see is pre-COVID. Um, so the BRFSS is an annual survey um, administered that collects data about health-related risk behaviors, chronic health conditions, and preventive services. Um, and just um, we saw high levels of overweight and obesity, which is not probably a big surprise to anybody. 58.2% um, of FEHD residents are overweight or obese. 38.1% are classified as overweight, which is slightly higher than Connecticut. Um, and 20.1% are obese, which is slightly lower than Connecticut. Um, low seasonal flu vaccine uptake. Um, our adults in the FEHD, about 50% of adults um, receive the flu vaccine annually. Um, the, the Healthy People 2030 goal is 70%. So you can see we're you know, relatively far behind that. Um, high household radon levels. Um, over 2,600 radon test kits were submitted and analyzed for the period of January 1st of 2005 to August 26th of 2022. Um, in all 10 towns, 20% or more of those houses that submitted radon test kits had radon levels that met or exceeded the EPA level, which is four picocuries per liter. Um, why is that important? Um, radon is the leading cause of death from lung cancer in non-smokers and the second leading cause of lung cancer deaths overall. In the FEHD, lung cancer was the leading cause of death from cancer for both males and females, accounting for 24.9% of all cancer deaths. Um, it is estimated that lung cancer deaths could be reduced two to 4% by lowering rate on levels in home. So back to Olivia's point about the criteria that we use, what is actionable, what is preventable, you know, that is something that, you know, education preventing, um, you know, if we can prevent those types of deaths. Um, and the last thing I'll mention on this slide is the affordable housing. Um, overall in the FEHD, 5.26% of housing units qualify as affordable, and specifically to Simsbury, 4.8% of, Sims, of Simsbury housing is considered affordable, which I'm sure you've talked about probably many times. Um, this was also a key theme that from our social, from our focus group with the town social service directors, this is really a very big concern um, for them. For that, uh, one, did you use the state definition of affordable housing, or I, yes, the deed restrictions and all that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, and that if you want to see where we got all of our sources, it's all in the full community health assessment. So. I'm going to try to be quick, but I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to keep it to 10 minutes, but um, <laughs> so next slide, please. So these are the ones where we went into a little bit more detail. Um, so adult mental health, again, we use the Connecticut BRFSS. Um, and as you can see from the pie chart, 65% of adults reported zero days of poor mental health, which is great. Although 23% reported one to seven days of poor mental health and 12% reported at least eight days of mental health. And again, this is in adults. Um, depression is a common and serious illness that can take several forms. 15.7% of FEHD adults reported that they were diagnosed with a depressive disorder. And then sadly, 46% of individuals who die by suicide have a known mental illness. I also want to mention, this is the, likely the tip of the iceberg. These numbers are all probably under, they are underreported by how much is not clear. But just keep that in mind when we're talking about these numbers. Um, so next slide, we're just gonna touch on youth mental health. Um, so this is another survey that we use. It's called the Connecticut School Health Survey. Again, this is administered annually to high school students. Um, and it's asked a series of questions. The first one being, during the past 30 days, on how many days was your mental health not good? 34% of high school students reported their mental health was not good for seven days or more. Almost 8% report mental health was not good for all 30 days. 
Um, and these percentages are much higher in the gay, lesbian, and bisexual group. Um, when it asked during the past 12 months, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that you stopped doing some usual activities? And 30.6% answered yes. This was a statistically significant increase from 2005. In 2005, it was 24.8%, and in 2019, it was 30.6%. So again, prior to the pandemic. 15.4% um, of students engaged in self-harm behaviors, 12.7 seriously considered suicide, and 6.7 attempted suicide. Again, underreported numbers. Um, next slide. Do, do you want to just mention that that's state and not? Oh, I'm sorry. That's yes. That is state. That is the Connecticut Schoolhouse Survey. They, we can't do. We can't drill down to FEHD because of the sample size. It would be too small mm -hmm. to really give a good representation. So I apologize. Those are Connecticut numbers. Um, so these. This. This is FEHD numbers. The Connecticut BRFSS. We can drill down to the FEHD level. Um, so substance use, so 25.5% of FEHD adults use e-cigarettes every day or some days. This was higher than the state of Connecticut. Um, excess, and the chart there shows excessive alcohol consumption, which includes binge drinking and heavy drinking. 20.6% of the FEHD population reports excessive alcohol consumption. This was, again, one of the things we noted with the town social service directors that alcohol use and alcohol abuse um, in the senior citizen population is currently at an all-time high. Um, so overdose deaths. Um, drug, deaths from drug overdoses um, quadrupled from 2015, where we had five to 21, and this is specifically FEHD data. Um, of the 103 drug overdoses since 2015, 74% were in males and 94% were in white non-Hispanic residents. Um, overall, the 35 to 44 year old age group had the highest number of drug overdoses um, and fentanyl has become um, much more involved in these drug overdoses as well as, which I don't have on the slide, but xylazine, which if you've heard of that is an animal tranquilizer um, that is more, more and more commonly found in these unintentional drug overdoses. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to say for sure this is like the good news, but the good news so far is that in 2022, we've only there have been seven deaths recorded, um, overdose deaths recorded in the FEHD. So those numbers aren't complete yet, but that's the data we have so far. Um, so next slide. Sorry, this is such a downer. <laughs> um, so the next slide, one of the other issues we see are with falls. Um, falls occur for a variety of reasons. Um, household hazards, improper footwear, medication issues, they are mostly preventable. Um, in the FEHD, 26.1% of adults responded they had fallen in the past year. Um, in the FEHD, accidents are the third leading cause of death, and 33.8% of those deaths from accidents are a result of the fall. They also are a significant cause of ED visits and hospitalizations among 65 and older. Um, and even when a fall doesn't result in an injury, it research shows that the fear of falling prompts individuals to do less activities, um, which is, causes them to become weaker, increasing their risk of falling. So um, that's sort of the data. Quickly, um, for more information and more, way more details, you can view the whole Farmington Valley Community Health Assessment using the QR code or the website there. It'll bring you to the PDF um, for your reading enjoyment. Um, and the next slide is at my last slide, and that is next steps. So what are our next steps? Broadly disseminating this information to community members, community assets, community partners, get the word out, let them know what we're doing. Um, we want, we're developing um, topic specific one page summaries for these items that we talked about. We're working on those. Those should be available um, early February. Um, we are going to prioritize the issues based on these key findings with feedback from community members, community partners. Um, we then will establish work groups um, involving organizations, agencies, community members with subject matter expertise and people that would like to be involved in moving this forward um, into the community health improvement plan 
uh, which has the goals, objectives, action steps, strategies. Um, so how can you help? You can help by getting the word out. Um, you can help by recommending community organizations and community members um, that would like to be involved in this project. Um, and I will, Olivia and I will leave our business cards on this table here um, if you would like to contact us um, for more information. So thank you so much for, for letting us share this. Um, I also want to mention I'm a Sinsbury resident. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. That was outstanding. <clears throat> oh, does anybody have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, I forgot about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the, it was, the, you said 52% uh, obesity? Yeah, 52% uh, overweight or obese. Categorizes overweight as, or obese. That's the Connecticut BRFSS where, you know, I think the question is, have you been told in the last 12 months that, or I think it's 12 months, are you, you know, overweight or obese? Oh, thank you. And just, uh, so I know that you said when do you, you started on the draft of the criteria for the, or tried to draft the criteria and would open ended into all these resources. Um, could you just, could you have, from your experience as, as professionals working in all aspects of healthcare and the primary folks that are your, who are your local uh, resources and partners that you talk to on a daily basis, do you think you could have just drafted that list of the top 10 just because of what your experiences are? Or was there something that actually stood out and shocked you? Or were these the things that you expected there to be on this I list? I think there were definitely some things that we saw in the secondary data. And, and you know, the secondary data really is just a very, is a piece of this whole puzzle. What I found very interesting is in talking to the town social service directors, it gave you like, here are the people actually working with the community, and this is what they're seeing. You can't, you never would see that in the secondary data. You might get glimpses of it, but you wouldn't know this, the, um, I would say the severity of the issue had you not talked to people. So in some cases, I think, yeah, overweight obesity, you know, that is a very common issue. It's growing, it's not getting any better. Um, those things, of course, we could have absolutely, you know, said, yeah, that's a top issue from experience. But I think looking at falls, you know, I didn't know that accidents were the third leading cause of death in the FEHD and that falls were such a large contributor to that. And then also looking at what goes into that, you know, all these preventative measures that could really help somebody, you know, looking at their footwear, looking at you know, the medication review, things like that. Uh, does that answer your question? It, it does. No, thank okay. you. I, just, was just, I was curious what the outline, the surprising outline. I, I could get, if you would ask me, I would have given you three things I think would have hit on there, but I never would have said falls. I never would have said radon. I never would have said, um, uh, sorry, yeah, if you might know. But you understand. Yeah, mine. Yeah, did you have something else to add? Yeah. Okay, all right. Eric has a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, looking at the list of uh, the, the sort of the top 10 themes, I don't know if I was surprised by the themes, but I was really shocked about the severity of some of these. And I hope that this can inform the work that our social services mm -hmm. department does as they're thinking about programming and we're thinking about funding other, uh, you know, related services. Um, and certainly if there's anything that can come back to this board from those work groups, I, I mm -hmm. hope that it will. Um, my question for you is uh, whether there is thoughts or plans around being able to replicate this data on an ongoing basis so that we can look at trends and what might be getting better. Yeah. Can I speak to that? Um, we're working towards accreditation and we also have to do annual report for the state health department and we're required to do this type of thing every five years. And, um, you know, when Chris asked about were there any surprises? Well, the other important aspect of collecting this data is to be able to track and monitor improvements over time and to identify populations at greatest risk, which, you know, there were some interesting themes like the overdose, the age groups, and white males as an example. Um, so, yes, every five years. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to add to that too. Um, when there will be certain indicators that we would likely, we haven't done this yet, but we will likely, we're working on this to have some type of a dashboard 
on our website that could show you how this is tracking. It's almost like uh, Healthy People does this with their goals. They have a goal and they show how they're tracking towards it. Um, and that will, all comes with the Community Health Improvement Plan. You know, when we have the strategies in place and we're working towards improving an indicator. So. And just one last comment since we have Rick here. Um, you know, when, if anyone works with data, it, it is very difficult sometimes with small populations to look deeper at um, issues around race, certain subsets where we don't have the sample size. So focus groups and conversations with um, populations that might be more vulnerable are something that we did not have the opportunity to do as broadly, but that's something that we'd like to see moving forward. Um, because fundamentally, you know, some of the challenges that, you know, our minority populations or low income individuals, et cetera, are having directly and negatively impact health. The data just doesn't allow us to explore that um, because of small sample size. Yeah, I would just um, like to say that, you know, one thing that we have been working on through the Aging and Disability Commission that I've been involved with as a liaison is the Aging Well and Simsbury survey uh, that we've been working on it with the Senior Center. And we had uh, 650 responses from uh, individuals 50 plus here in Simsbury. And we're analyzing that data and then hoping to drill down with some focus groups. So I'm really hoping that we can, you know, um, coordinate and and talk about some of that as we tease out some of this information in the focus groups because I think there's going to be some um, overlap and it could help inform some of our recommendations for um, for things moving forward so I'm, I'm excited to see all this data because I think there's a lot of, of uh, common themes there and as much as so presenting the data presents challenges the one thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about, but we did put in the community health assessment is the immense number of assets and resources that are available across our 10 towns, be that, you know, the types of commissions, organizations, agencies already working on these topics. So um, a lot to draw from. That's great. So I do have a general question. You said most of, most of the data is pre-COVID, right? Um, are there plans to in, kind of integrate the trends that have happened since COVID? Um, yeah. Because people did get, some people got healthier during COVID and got out more. Um, some people might have indulged more and things. So I was just curious if there's like an overlay to what's this. Yes, data. there is. There is a lag um, in the data. So, you know, when we're looking at that, I tried to pull um, the 2021 BRFSS numbers mm -hmm. just to see if there was a difference there and I don't think we're going to get those until maybe August so right I think it was around August so there is a lag but yes absolutely I'm very interested to see you know some of the things and what happened um, you know over time yeah, thank you yep you're welcome I already got mine before oh, okay Heather um, yeah I think very interesting. Um, I'm curious, the, so when you collected this data prior, you were saying five, every five years. Um, we haven't done it before. This was really, this was the first time. Oh, the very this first. This was the first time. Because, okay, yeah. then I reckon my question was, um, you know, with, between that time, were there any improvements and is there anything that you see that's worked? This was the first time we did it. Well, well, it will be interesting to see what you can do with this data. Um, you know, I know with the one thing you were saying with the minority, different minority groups and things, it's it's unfortunate that it's you don't have the population sample to drill into that because I know, you know, different groups are more, you know, are prone to, um, you know, um, blood pressure issues and in and, and different groups and, and just, um, I guess, you know, different, just not only the resources, but certain, uh, groups are more prone to different conditions, so it would be interesting to see that. But I look forward to see what you do with the data and how we can help. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's sure. really informative. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So our second presentation tonight is um, Tom, Tom, and Adam. I'm here to talk about the trails and the sidewalks. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I think there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of years, really, about all of the different bike projects we have. So we're trying tonight to kind of recap all of it in a very short time. I know that we've already had a, a presentation tonight, but if you want, maybe we can even just go to the next slide and we'll kind of hit just the topics that we're trying to cover. Um, Adam's going to kind of go through the active bike path construction, which is going on right now. Um, we're going to then touch on a couple of the um, bike paths, which are um, in design, two different projects, two different phases. We're going to talk about our new sidewalks. That's where we're putting in sidewalks where we didn't have them previously. Um, biggest challenge I think we always face, and I'm going to leave that to Tom Taberski to talk about the ongoing maintenance. Um, once you build it, you have to maintain it, and I think that's always the, the challenge. And then we'll um, close it out with just talking about our sidewalk replacement program. So we'll see. Next one. So we probably have seen in Terraville, there's some construction going on and we are uh, lucky to break ground, uh, I believe around November on that project. And thankfully mother nature has cooperated so that we can continue working on it. Um, we'll try to let the contractor work as long as, uh, as he can um, with the weather. But that project um, was a joint effort between Simsbury and Bloomfield. Uh, that's been going on for, for a number of years. Uh, total project value was about $3 million. Uh, that includes the design and permitting uh, fees as well as construction. Uh, we received a grant in the amount of $2.3 million, uh, and Simsbury's portion, design and construction, uh, totaled about $376,000. Um, we're hoping that we can finish this around September, October next year. Uh, that's kind of a tentative construction date, um, completion. A lot of the work that you'll see as uh, we get into the construction season this year is going to be the intersection improvements um, and a lot of the work associated with that. Um, right now, we're kind of isolated to just rock removal and some drainage work, trying to stay out of the road just in case it snows. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Our next project, which uh, is another oldie but a goodie, is uh, from Hot Meadow to Curtis Park. Um, this project takes us from uh, the trail uh, around Route 10 and 315, or Terrafield Road, and um, ends at Curtis Park where the soccer fields are. Um, this one has been, I think, in the works for just as long as uh, the Terrafield to Bloomfield Trail. Um, we were fortunate enough to use a deep trails grant to pay for a lot of the uh, design work. Um, it was about $385,000 um, grant in total where Simsbury puts up about 80,000 of that, 80-20 uh, split. Uh, so we've been using that for our design services um, and permitting. Right now, we are waiting on an Army Corps permit um, to round out about seven different agency reviews. Um, we recently got our local wetland uh, permit uh, just last week and uh, we'll probably be in front of zoning for the flood management stuff. Um, this area is, is very environmentally sensitive, uh, being near the river, and so all the, the permitting efforts has been going on for about, I think, two years now. Um, stuck in that limbo. Um, in terms of construction, we'll, we're patiently waiting for a grant approval that we applied for back in, was it 2019? 18 or 19. 18 or 19. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's a transportation set-aside program uh, through DOT. And again, it's another 80-20 uh, kind of grant split. Um, last year, they reached out, uh, CROG and DOT, to kind of update our construction costs because things have changed a little bit since 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like we are at the top of the list. So once they're ready to roll out the grant awards, uh, we'll hear hopefully this month. Um, and to go through that grant process will probably be 
uh, going through some hoops over the next year. But for $2 million, we'll, we'll do a lot of hoop hopping for that. Mm -hmm. um, so if everything goes well uh, this summer uh, with that process, we'll be into construction in 2024 uh, for that section. I'll budget for that one, yeah. given the recent the next slide next slide. issue. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, this is, oh, we already hit on that. Look at I think, that. I think you hit all the points. Yeah. Right? Um, it's like I've been involved. I, I, think, I think the one point you didn't touch on, though, is there is a chance that we may be able to reapply for the DEEP Recreational tra Trails Grant, which may help offset our portion of the TA set-aside grant, that 20% portion. Hmm. Um, the other thing I think that um, with all of those permits, including Army Corps. We've also been working in coordinating with uh, National Park Service. Um, significant level of oversight, significant level of requirements that wouldn't be included in a normal project if we weren't dealing with the wild and scenic Farmington River. Mm -hmm. Oh, now, now we're getting on to the, probably the most challenging of all the new trails, which is getting from Curtis Park into Terrafield proper. Um, shown up here are just a bunch of conceptual alignments of where it can go. Um, again, we have challenging environmental concerns with, with being near the river, but with that also comes really just an amazing opportunity to connect a trail with the river and really tie those two things together. And I think we have the opportunity to do it in a real way that shows our leadership in an environmental um, capacity and, and really make the trail something special and something that would be um, highlighted by other communities looking to do this type of work. If you go to the next slide. Um, this is actually a picture from last winter showing there is actually already some walking trails down in that area. Um, there's actually some remnants of the former rail bed back in there. Um, and we also have the challenge with um, the houses and the condos down in that area and where to go and be respectful of those people. Uh, we've had several meetings with National Park Service, Farmington River Wild and Scenic Committee, and Farmington River Watershed, um, trying to get some level of buy-in early, find out um, where the areas are that we may be able to um, work through, what are the areas that they absolutely don't want to see a trail in, what are some of the uh, issues that we can hopefully design around now. Uh, we are currently um, beginning the survey portion, and we are also, through a separate process, working with CROG on possible alignments. Um, they are looking to finalize the pathway for the East Coast Greenway, and they were doing a study that involved Bloomfield and Hartford, and we were able to attach ourselves to that to get some of their resources to help go through this process. Next slide. So new sidewalks. Um, Again, we go back to the fact that we've been very fortunate with grant fundings, and we are hopefully going to be in construction spring of 2023 with the um, Route 10 sidewalk piece, which is going to go from um, Hoskins all the way up to Wolcott, up to the DOT maintenance facility. It's going to go into Dorset Crossing, uh, really provide a nice connection for that area. We were also able to add some decorative street lighting. And part of the reason I know it's a shocking number when you see 1.7 million is we also have to do a number of utility relocations and other work associated with that. So we have a contractor under contract and basically they're starting to do their prep work. And hopefully as soon as we get into spring, we're gonna be off and moving, so. Nice. Uh, Firetown Road Sidewalk, which we <laughs> got two grants for that one is currently under design. We're designing that in-house. Um, Adam and Dan Gannon in our engineering department are working on that. We've been doing a bit of um, outreach at this point with some of the residents. We have a conceptual design. A letter went out, I believe you were all copied on it. A uh, number of people have reached back out to our engineering department and we're actually uh, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with any property owners that have any questions or concerns. And we are looking, due to the fact that we have to go through the lots of grant process, we're not gonna be able to, or we're not gonna target it for this summer, we're gonna target it for uh, 2024. All right, here's the fun part. Let's talk about maintenance. Um, so you, we, we hear, I'm sure you guys, as, as your uh, town administrators, you hear all the time, the town doesn't do enough to maintain the trails. I, I get it all the time. You can't make everybody happy. There's seven miles of trail that cuts directly through the center of town and many more miles of side trails through town. Um, Parks and Rec Department is always listening to those people. We, we were working as best as we can with the equipment and the people that we have, but we wanted to highlight some of the most recent work so that you're aware of it. Um, currently, if you've been out, if you were walking the trail last week, you saw our crews going north to south, 
uh, knocking back brush uh, with a big orange tractor, knocking back brush and removing li fallen limbs and uh, taking debris out that Eversource left behind from some of their tree cutting work a couple of years ago, um, especially in the weed tog area. So they've been cleaning up that. We just in the picture here is just the new fence we just installed from Canal Way up to Latimer Lane. Um, that's replacing an existing three rail split split rail three rail split rail fence that was uh, there since the, since I think the, the property or the trail was built most likely. A lot of those poles in the ground were just rotting were rotting away. The rails had rails had fallen off. Um, so we've replaced that. Uh, we are now we have a project out to bid right now to go from Latimer Lane all the way up to the Weetog commuter lot in Winslow Place. Um, we accept that bid will come back on February 9th and then we hope to award it quickly after that and, and get them moving. The weather's been favorable. Um, so by the end of March, we hope to have that section of trail done with new fencing as well. Um, we replaced signage in the Hazel Meadow area recently. We took down a fence panel that we, we determined was an obstruction um, to sight line as you, for traffic crossing the trail um, at one of the, at the residents' request. And we'll be looking at more at the Hazel Meadow fencing going forward. Those, that fencing, if you're familiar with, it's a little bit different than this split rail. It's more like the stockade style. Mm -hmm. So what we have happening here and in, in the last three years have, have been um, particularly troublesome for us is a lot, a lot of these windstorms that have been kicking up. The poles that hold up that stockade fence are, again, 20 something years old at this point, and they're just rotting away. So every time we get a big windstorm, the fence panels blow down. So as you as you go through there, you'll see a lot new, a lot of new poles and older fencing, but uh, even the the stockade fencing is starting to deteriorate. So we're looking at our options there to to get more of that, and over the next couple of years, we'll continue to go north, replacing more sections of trail, uh, or trail fencing in particular. Um, if you've been behind Mitchell Auto Dealership, we worked with uh, Steve Mitchell to, you know, kind of came to a mutual agreement to, re to actually remove the split rail fencing that was there. Um, you know, a lot of these places, like in this particular picture. The rail serves a safety purpose. I mean, it, it, there's a heavy drop down into a swamp or a bog or, or a hill. Um, the area behind Mitchell, there's really no purpose for that fence. So we took it out. It actually made, helps us. We don't have to weed whack around it anymore. We don't have to mow around it. So that fence was, was quite deteriorated. So we just removed that this fall. And now you have a nice clean area going through there that's easier for us to maintain. Um, and then in, in that same commuter parking lot, if you've noticed, um, about a year and a half ago, we installed new fencing around the perimeter of that parking lot that borders the trail. What we had is the old fencing, split rail fencing. A lot of people were just backing into it all the time as they, so, and it was constantly being replaced. So now we put that heavy duty fencing. It's very similar to what's along Iron Horse between the trail and the, and the street. Um, and then what else are we doing right now? Um, and then we're tree printing. We've been tree printing constantly from Granby Line to Iron Horse, and we're gonna keep going north, uh, north to south in that direction. Um, the guys uh, all fall were blowing leaves as much as possible. I mean, we could blow leaves one day and the next day we get an overnight windstorm and it comes down again. We only have so many, so many available hours during the growing season to, to keep doing that. But we, we do our best. Um, and then I don't want to take no, your steal your thunder from from no, repaving, not. but <laughs> most recently the, Lat the, the Latimer Lane to Route 10 area was repaved a few years ago. And at the same time, they also did that stone dust running trail that runs alongside the bike, uh, the multi-use path, and that, that, and you can see it actually in this picture. So it's a good example of it. Um, and I don't. Do you have any more paving projects coming up? No, right now. I think we're in good shape. Right now, knock on wood, most of the paving seems to be in very good condition. Um, I'm sure there are some cyclists who would like it smoother in some areas, but everything is for the next, I'd say, three to four years in really good shape. Yeah. No, it's. It, I mean, it's it's a gem of an op of a asset to the town. We do our best to maintain it. I mean, again. You're going to hear more, you're going to hear a request from Maria and I for an additional staff person this year that was you know uh, recommended in the capital plan of the or our master plan a few years ago. You know we have eight guys that are typically on on the on the road doing uh, in the parks and the trails doing work during the growing season from April to November when that trail is used its heaviest. There's just not enough time in the day to get to that. Um, we do our best. Um, we try to meet the demand, um, and then again we have side trails that need that need issues. We have roots erupting through some of these older neighborhood trails. We have trees falling down all the time <laughs> due to tree disease and whatnot age in the, uh, along the wooded trails. And we, we do our best to keep them available and open to the public, but um, it takes time, it takes money. You guys have been very supportive the last few years with, tree, with additional funds for tree pruning. Uh, that has certainly helped some and will continue to help. 
Um, we are, if you want to go to the next slide, Marissa, oh, Melissa. Can I just make a comment? Go back for yep. one second. Sure. That, if you haven't been there, that's that's right by the canal, the old Canal Place apartments. It's one of the prettiest places in town. It yeah. really is. There's a good guys, there's scenic views there, birds, job. all kinds of birds in there. But if you look out over the marsh there, it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. So you guys did a nice job in that spot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what's what's upcoming? We're going to continue to remove, I already you know said this, but we're going to continue to remove and install new fencing, continue our tree pruning through the next few years, and obviously for as long as it takes. Um, Hazel Meadow area I hit on, and in the picture here, we are asking for a CNR request this year. It was in the budget last year as well. Uh, this is called a vent track tractor um, with a boom. This has a boom attachment. We can also hook up a blower to the front of it. Um, so with this tractor, we can mow uh, the roadside, the trail ro trail sides. We can trim back with this boom tractor, this boom attachment, trim back some of the vegetation. Um, I found a picture with a good example of them doing trail work. Uh, we're adding miles of trail. This is a, this is an asset or a piece of equipment that would really help us out. Right now, like I think you, you nodded when I said the big orange tractor last week, we're using a, a giant tractor to try to do, try to do some of this work. It, 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 it's not it's like using a uh, cannon to kill a fly instead of a fly swatter. You know, it's <laughs> it's really not the best piece of equipment for it. I mean, something like this is uh, would be more would be more applicable. It would allow it not only on the trail, but also allow us to do some work in the parks with it as well along the tree lines. Um, so we're, we're going to ask for that. I, I believe I think I have fifty five thousand in the CNR request for it. Um, we're familiar with the piece of equipment. The golf course has, has one like, like this, um, that they use a lot on their tree lines. Unfortunately, we just, it's a shared piece of equipment that they use heavily. Uh, we just don't have the time to do it, um, to share it as much as we would, would have liked to. But, um, with seven miles of trail, this, this thing could go up and down and up, up, down one way and back up the other in the same day, um, and not be a huge disturbance to uh, those who are on the trail, like the big orange tractor is. So. Um, I'm hoping you'll support that as we go through the budget process. And um, does anybody have any questions? Can we have slide, oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> One more slide. <laughs> we, got, we didn't. We didn't practice our research here. <laughs> and, and I didn't come with any no. ask. I just, you know, I'm telling happy stories. I, <laughs> I have a question. Like as you're talking about maintenance, and I know this is going to fall into Tom's area, but I, I've received this question from residents where, especially with our winters not being as snowy. I think that people oftentimes think in the winter time we're doing plowing, right? And 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 me and then what are you, if there's no snow, then you know what, what what are you working on? But I think that there's a lot more maintenance and other things happening, oh, obviously, absolutely. than absolutely. you know, even though there isn't the snow on the ground and, and the plows out on the streets that you typically it's, see. It's funny you say that Maria and I were just talking last week. We're gonna be doing a high we're gonna be highlighting it on our social media channels the next couple of weeks. The work, you know, we don't hibernate during the winter. All this work. Right. We've got pictures of the trail fencing, pictures of them pushing back the brush. There's so many things in the parks that with this favorable weather has done has allowed us to do a lot of tree pruning in the parks this year. Um, you know, we don't always get a winter like this, but when it does, our guys would much rather be outside than stuck in a garage all day. Trust me. Um, typically during the winter, they're doing preventive maintenance on, on machines and things like that. We don't mm -hmm. need necessarily every guy doing that. They're maintaining the rink, but they've been able to do a lot of, of this trail of, again, this trail maintenance, tree, tree removal, um, hopefully we're going to be tearing out a playground very soon, um, before the growing season starts. So, um, you know, they're busy all year, all year long. So, well, it's funny. We, we, we have, you know, records of what our staff is spending time on and the plowing is critical when it happens on a day like today, we needed to get out and salt the roads. But, um, again, it's a small portion, but it's, it's a portion that's high, highlighted quite a bit. Uh, but similarly, we're, we're working year round and, um, during the winter and in the fall, it is tree work. Uh, it's drainage work for us, and we buy them winter coats and winter gloves because they work when it's cold, mm -hmm. and they work when it's really cold. And on the days where it's brutally cold, we bring them in the shop, and we have plenty of equipment that needs to be maintained. And um, you know, anytime you, you you know, if you come out to our shop, even the tr regular truck drivers and equipment operators during the winter will do welding and heavy maintenance on the equipment if that's what's required. So it's really a a, a talented talented bunch of individuals and. The to-do list has never gotten done. Hmm. <laughs> so, speaking of which, so uh, our last little section of different things that we were covering is uh, a couple years ago, we started a sidewalk rehabilitation program. Um, when you were looking at the 12 miles of existing sidewalks at that, that point in time, for years, they'd been let to deteriorate. The town for a long time had an um, ordinance which basically said if we were redoing an entire stretch of sidewalk, we were going to assess the abutting property owners for that expense. 
it just never seemed reasonable or fair, especially in Simsbury where sidewalks are on one side of the street, not the other. So you have the burden of shoveling the snow, yet the family across the street whose kids used to go to school aren't gonna pay for that. So we, we changed that ordinance and I think it was the right thing to do. We did a townwide assessment of all of our sidewalks and our curb ramps. Um, curb ramps are critical because it's a ADA responsibility for the town. A number of municipalities across the country have uh, been sued for not having um, a program in place to get their curb ramps up to, uh, to par. Um, so as part of our rehabilitation, we are uh, making significant headway on the curb ramp. So the program's been in effect since um, FY19. We're spending about $200,000 a year. We did the Musket Trail neighborhood, Firetown Road from Plank Hill to Squadron Line. We did a number of the side streets in the center of town. Uh, we did Elm Street, which is the photo here, and a couple of side streets. Um, and just recently, we did that section of Route 10 from Wiggins Farm to Woodland Street. Um, and these are incredibly efficient projects. We're designing them in-house um, and we're getting these significant sidewalk projects done for $200,000 or less, um, which especially when you compare it to these larger lots of pro programs where we're building new sidewalks, it, it, it's, it's apples and oranges. Um, so we've done over three miles of sidewalks at this point. We've brought 62 of those curb ramps into compliance. More importantly, because we have what's called an ADA transition plan in place, we are compliant and we are not subject to being sued. Um, the other part of that is we're doing the right thing for our community um, of older people, of people who have um, eyesight issues, people who have uh, mobility issues. So um, with this, I think once we start to get a little farther along in the program, we should really talk about transitioning this program to catch some of these neighborhood trails that Tom was talking about. They're somewhat orphaned. They're, they're in poor condition. They're town assets. I really think they should be kind of brought to the forefront in our, in our program. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice job, guys. Thank you. I am, I'm so excited about this work. And I'm going to edit this meeting and take this clip of this presentation so that it's digestible for members of the community and put it out there because I know how a lot of people are yeah. really interested in yeah. this. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sticking around. Wendy. Just, yeah, Thursday. Oh, yeah, just quickly, if sure. I could, I'd also just really um, like to thank the board um, for your investment and so much of this work that we're doing. Um, you may recall, probably, you know, Sean and, and Eric and Chris have, have been with me during my, my time here. And, you know, I came to you with some concepts that were new, right? Like, we should be setting aside money in our capital budget to be able to do trail maintenance, and we should be investing in our sidewalks on an annual basis and, and really emphasizing the importance of taking care of our, you know, um, the assets that we had, the infrastructure that we had, and we hadn't been doing such a very good job of that. We couldn't do this work if you all hadn't supported that at a policy level and funded it, right? That piece is so important and so critical. So I also just really want to thank all of you for that continued investment in this infrastructure because we could not do it without the dollars that you have, have allocated. So thank you as well. Appreciate that. Sure. Guys. Bye. See you. Um, so move into the first selectman's report. Uh, just going to try to keep it pretty short. I wanted to thank the Martin Luther King Day committee and town staff that helped facilitate that this year at Eno Hall in its new location. Um, I want to congratulate Simsbury Community Media on their brand new studio. Hi, Simsbury Community Media. Um, it was it was a really nice presentation um, from the president and Patrick and a few other speakers, and we got to play around with some of the new equipment and the really cool ESPN desk that um, Don Colantonio, I think, got to bring over there. Uh, a few people were here tonight and they were talking about um, cannabis, but I don't know if they didn't see the rest of the meeting or read, but we did make a, um, we did bring it to a vote last meeting at the board and everyone um, on the board expressed their views. Um, and I thought it was really nicely handled that we could all share how we felt and um, we took a vote and there is plans for an ordinance, which we have a draft attached to tonight and there will be a public hearing on that February 13th, I believe. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was on the budgets coming up. So to, uh, Maria and staff have been really hard at work at least this month working on it, I think every day. And then in the month of February, Maria takes it back and works with her team to get the budget pretty much cleaned up 
before it comes to us at the end of February. And then that pretty much is our month of March is working with the budget and trying to get um, everything finalized before it goes to the Board of Finance and before it goes out to referendum. And the last thing I'm going to give a plug for is we have some upcoming town manager office hours. Um, I happen to be the first one on the agenda. There's one, going to be one every month at the end of the month in another location in town with another um, member of town leadership and another selectman. Um, the first one is next Monday from 5 to 6 in the main meeting room. So hopefully people will come so it's not just Maria and I drinking Dunkin's. Um, and I will attach the schedule. I'll send that out with my first selectman reports. So everybody has it. And that's all I have. Great. Turn it over to Maria. Thank you, Thank you Wendy. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to be very brief this evening. Um, I just wanted to quickly report out on some of the very good work that our new youth and family social worker um, has been busy doing. So she um, has been a great addition to the team. She's been very busy with coordinating um, programs and events for our youth in the community. Um, there's some upcoming program we wanted to highlight just to, again, make you aware of. Um, we're going to be offering a program on um, healthy relationships. Um, that course is going to be offered in February for teens, um, as well as um, we're going to be encouraging um, folks to have conversations um, with their um, with their parents and guardians as well and also raising awareness around domestic violence issues so a very important topic um, in March ginger cats from a courage to speak foundation um, is going to be presenting to ninth and tenth grade students um, to spread awareness about opioid prevention uh, and then we'll also be offering a course for parents on that as well uh, another uh, program they're working on in February, um, we're so grateful for this, um, and again, our social work, youth, uh, youth and family social workers coordinating Narcan training um, for our staff. Um, so that's uh, helpful, um, and we'll be having that on hand in, in our uh, municipal buildings as well in the event that it needed to be used. Um, so they are working on additional programs, home alone safety, babysitting training, anxiety and coping skills, et cetera. Um, they're going to be advertising um, the program dates, times, locations, any registration requirements um, through social media. Um, so we did just want to make sure that we were providing the link for anybody who is not currently um, liking the Community and Social Services Facebook page. If you're interested in getting updates about these programs, that's a really great way to do it. And just want to encourage folks to do that um, so they can stay up to date on the future program offerings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So we're up to the selectman liaison and subcommittee reports. Um, you want to start with Heather? If she have, you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add today. Okay, good. Sean? Nothing. Nothing. Amber? I just want to give a brief shout out. There is going to be an indoor tailgate party on Sunday, February 5th at the Simsbury Public Library and you can register with the library or the senior center by February 2nd and so what it is going to be is just a social gathering an indoor tailgate party for the Yukon women's basketball game against South Carolina the party will run from 11:30 to 3 in the program room and the game will be shown on the big screen and they're going to have sandwiches snacks and desserts and drinks so if you're looking for a fun event that would be something in the winter time to take it out and do. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah, yeah. The uh, Simsbury DEI uh, committee is holding a uh, Black History event next month where a resident will be sharing her family's story of enslavement and resilience. And it'll be uh, moderated by Nkosi Lee, anyone who uh, remembers their past presentations. He's a great facilitator. That's going to be on February 9th at 6 o'clock p.m. at the library, and you can register and find more information on the library's website. Also, uh, I give a plug to um, the uh, data work that's um, starting with the uh, DEI committee. So we had an excellent and, you know, frankly, disturbing presentation earlier tonight about from the Farmington Valley Health District. And one of the comments that was made was that it's hard to drill down into um, sort of populations that are smaller in the um, health district. And that's exactly what this um, survey uh, work, this data collection work, is aimed to do um, here in Simsbury that this group funded previously. And that work is going to be kicking off this year. So um, Rick, thank you in advance for your work on this. Chris, you have anything? Nope. Okay. All right, so before we move into selectman action, I was going to ask for a motion to amend tonight's agenda to table item E. Um, we have There's a couple of things we need to follow up on before we, we finalize that and to bring it back um, at our next February 13th meeting. So I'll move that. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Um, first up is the tax refund requests, and I'm going to ask for a motion effective January 23rd to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $15,654.71 and to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the tax refunds. Move that. I'll second. Uh, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Um, so tonight we have a couple of classifications, personnel, HR type items, which I'm going to defer to Maria on. Um, so the first one up is um, the public works driver technician classification. Great. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so this particular item we did bring to the personnel subcommittee. Uh, we had received a reclassification request um, from one of our employees who's represented by the AFSCME uh, unit. Um, we did follow through with the reclassification review um, and found that it was warranted based on the scope and scale of the duties uh, that had grown with the position to create a new job description and classification, uh, which is public works driver technician. So this is very similar to our driver mechanic classification. Some of you may recall, while we didn't make a pay grade change to that position, I think it was approximately two or so years ago, we brought some job description updates to you. So this is designed as a classification that can be flexible and that the person can perform a number of our truck driver sort of um, maintainer duties, um, but also perform the higher level technician level work. Um, and uh, we have reached a tentative agreement with the union on essentially the, the pay grade, uh, the classification description. Um, and we also thought it was important and they were willing to agree to this. Um, there has been a history of shared work uh, within the bargaining unit as well as shared work with contractors. And we felt that it was important um, for management to maintain that right and to document it and memorialize it. Um, they were um, very cooperative and collaborative with us on that point and did agree to that as well. And we would just codify that in the MOA with them. Okay, uh, anyone up here have any questions? Okay. Um, no. Okay. Ask for um, looking for a motion effective January twenty third, twenty twenty three, to approve the creation, the truck driver technician job classification and job description as presented. Further move to establish the position at grade T seven of the AFSCME employees pay plan. Further move to endorse authorization of the town manager to enter into into a memorandum of agreement codifying the terms of the tentative agreement on the matter with the union and the incumbent. No, oh, that was hard to read. Move that. <laughs> Second. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that moves on. Uh, the next one is the budget director classification, which also came to personnel um, where we discussed and asked questions. I'm going to turn that over to Maria. Great, thank you. So um, this opportunity came to us um, through a recent retirement on the Board of Education side. Um, as you know, we started to move forward um, with the integration of shared financial management services some number of years ago. It started with uh, Amy taking over as the finance director for the Board of Education. And then as we've had subsequent um, retirements, various positions such as the deputy finance director position, you may recall, again, we brought that to you, I think, about a year and a half ago now where we restructured that position so they could take on shared financial management duties with the Board of Education. So in that vein, um, Amy and I working with our superintendent um, worked on a proposal bringing to you that we would take and repurpose the Board of Education position um, into a budget uh, director position that we would share between the two entities. Um, we would keep the home base for that person with the town um, and as part of this, um, we will also be as part of the 7-1 the budget process, um, we'll just be taking a look at the accounting and the coding. We essentially now, if this is approved this evening, we'll have four of our positions that are now providing shared duties um, to the two entities. So it would be the uh, director, the deputy director, an existing accounting position, and then again, if approved tonight, the budget director position. So when we did cost out, really based on the workload, um, ultimately this really is a, about a cost, it's cost neutral in terms of the entities. Um, it's not an overall body count to our overall budget. Again, it's just repurposing an accountant position that was with the Board of Ed to this budget director um, position. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions on the topic? I just, I have one is the shared services agreement. Will that come back to us at some point or yeah, it doesn't? It, it wouldn't need to. So the way we had structured it, there was a section under the agreement that you all approved. I think it was January of 2020. Does that sound, sound right? January, yes. February of 2020, um, where there was an amendment section that said, you know, if we needed to make adjustments um, to the shared services that the town was providing or shared services um, that the board was providing that the superintendent and I could adjust accordingly. So in this case, there's a payment section that we would just make sure to update to reflect the new coding that okay. we would use moving forward. Okay. 
Maybe a quick, quick question. Just um, I understand uh, where the the work being done on behalf of the BOE was being done, but currently, just for, for a clarification, who is doing the work now? Under what title that is going to be filling the the be the, the town's part of that? Half uh, yes. half allocation. Yes. So, um, if I'm following your question correctly, um, it was a a senior accountant position at the board of ed, mm -hmm. as well as um, a lot of the budget work right now that the deputy town manager position is currently uh, providing. I would say primarily that's where a lot of um, the budget duties have been. Have Perfect. Been Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, looking for a motion effective January twenty third. 2023 to endorse the creation of the position classification of budget director and the job description as presented further move to endorse effective July 1st 2022 a salary range of 93.5 to 114.465 for the position and further move to endorse the amendments to the shared services agreement with the Simsbury Board of Education. Move that. So Second. I'll second. <laughs> I'm it. getting right. beat out on both sides. Beat, so that's fine. It. Hey, it's one one of our goals, isn't it? <laughs> that's I mean, fine. This is, this is, a good, this um, is really so good. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that. Right, exactly, Sean. I was going to say that. This is great that it's. Yeah. This is one of our goals, right? This is achieving, a, right, keep going. Our goal to. Yeah. Well. If I, if I could quickly, so thank you so much again. I know shared services has been important to you. It's been very important to us the last few years as we continue to build out that model. Um, and just a little precursor since Tom is still here, um, I'm really proud of the work that he has been doing in collaboration with the Board of Ed. Mm -hmm. And during budget, um, we are going to be coming to you with a shared financial, um, I'm sorry, a shared fleet management um, proposal between the Board of Ed and the town. So again, some really good work is still happening. Very excited about that one and just wanted to share that that's forthcoming. Looking forward to it. Oh, that's really um, cool. the, the next yeah. item is the dispatcher's successor collective bargaining agreement for 2022 to 2025. And I will let Maria uh, talk about this one also. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a small uh, group of employees um, that are our dispatchers union. Um, they are rep uh, represented by UE. Um, currently, there are six people represented by that group because we do have a vacancy. Um, you may recall that the last round of contract negotiations with them, um, we did spend a lot of time doing a significant amount of uh, housekeeping cleanup, modernization of the contract. Um, and we covered, I think, a lot of really good groundwork. So this time, um, the larger focus was really on um, economics. And um, I think that the agreement was certainly negotiated in good faith. Um, the general wage increases that we were seeing um, in terms of our um, in terms of statewide data, the negotiated settlement data that we were seeing, we were seeing you know, averages in between 2.35, 2.45. Um, with public safety contracts, we are seeing in some cases a little higher, more on the 2.5 to 2.75 range. Um, we did take a look at some dispatcher contracts in our region as well um, to confirm some of those trends that we were seeing. Um, so I think that the GWIs that we've negotiated are very comparable with market and, and what we're seeing. Um, the, another small adjustment we pro proposed in the contract was really just for the duration of this contract, um, but was for allowing um, a higher sick leave accrual um, per month, um, particularly what we were finding for our more junior employees because they accrue on a monthly basis. They don't get a lump sum up front like some of our other bargaining units is that particularly if they were getting COVID um, and then if they were ending up with like a long quarantine period, that that was proving somewhat challenging for folks to, to manage. So again, our thought was is um, for the particular, again, duration of the contract um, that we would allow for a slightly higher accrual, sick leave accrual per month. Um, we also um, had, I believe in this case, a very small number of employees um, that were still contributing 6.5% um, towards their DB plan. Um, grandfathered employees were employees hired prior to 2016. Um, the DB plan is closed to, to hires um, after that date, and they will be increasing their contribution to the pension plan to 7%, um, starting retroactively to July, July uh, 1. And then again, we just did some additional housekeeping language, um, some minor changes to things such as um, uniforms, language on uniforms, probationary period, et cetera. Um, so we have included that along with the cost analysis. Melissa always does an excellent job um, showing the total value of the contract over the life of the contract. 
Um, and so as the ratification body, um, you do have three options available to you. Um, you know, one is that you could authorize um, us to execute the agreement, which again, I would recommend since it was negotiated in good faith. Um, the second option would be for you to reject the agreement um, and we would have to go back for further bargaining or potentially utilize the services of a mediator. And option C is that if you just simply take no action, um, it would become effective 30 days from the date in which um, Sherry, who is their business rep, and I um, signed off on the um, tentative agreement. Okay. Um, anybody have any comments? I just got one. I, what is a woolly pulley? What? <laughs> Edward. A what? It's in the uniform section. Labor. Right? And it's, it is a very important <laughs> item to some people. It's essentially the equivalent of like a sweater. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, caught my eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> well, we it's must be a brand. British I, sounding. Yeah, the labor union. I guess my comment in some ways is, you know, we just sat through tri-board meeting where we talked about inflation running at about like six and a half to seven percent. I find it I remarkable know. that that this is being negotiated at about two and a half percent mm-hmm. in light of of that. Yes, I mean, it's. It, Yes, it's a very interesting trend. Um, Board of Ed settlements during this inflationary period are coming out much higher than our municipal um, counterparts. Where I honestly can't speak to why or how, but it is just this very unusual trend, and we're just not seeing municipal settlements coming in really much above two and a half, unless there's something extraordinary. You know, maybe they're giving something in exchange for a higher GWI, yeah. uh, but not simply for inflation, which is very, very interesting. I don't think that's a secret. <laughs> like no, what the economy so is right I, now. I don't know. We did have a rain delay today. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew I was going to get that in somewhere. Anybody else? Could, uh, so I, I would ask for a motion uh, to go with option A um, to move effective January 23rd, 2023, to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the proposed successor collective bargaining agreement between the town. To, of Simsbury and the following unions, which I will let you read them, um, which will enter into effect retroactively from July 1st, 2022 and expire on June 30th, 2025. So moved. Thank you. I'll second. Good, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We yeah, have a couple of yeah. resignations. <laughs> um, Interesting. I gotta go through a lot of pages to get to the. Yeah, that email is long. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have the uh, resignation of Gene Ott from the Simsbury DEI Council. As for a motion retroactive to January 5th, 2023, to accept the resignation of Jean Ott as a regular member of the Simsbury DEI Council. So moved with our thanks. Second. Yeah. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 And the reappointment of Ian Erickson to the Aging and Disability Commission. As for a motion effective January 23rd, 2022, to reappoint Ian as a regular member of the Aging and Disability Commission with a term ending January 1st, 2027. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so those are good. Any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? Not good to me. Okay, and then I just wanted to point out um, there's the draft ordinance in our communication section for those to read it that will be put out for the public notice right um and then we'll have the hearing on the 21st to discuss it i did have a question on that so um, i was confused there's a 2013th sorry there's a there's a definition section and then a bunch of those definitions aren't used in the actual ordinance and i was trying to understand why are we defining terms that weren't then used yeah and bob is on so i would just yeah. defer to, he was a great help in, in drafting uh, much of the ordinance um bob do you want to speak to that hey bob so, okay. Did he hear the question? I don't know if you heard my question, Bob. I was just wondering, you know, overall, well, I had two questions. One, there was verbiage defined up top that doesn't appear to be used later on. And I was wondering, I didn't know if maybe a section was missing. And then two, um, we took a left and started talking about hemp within the ordinance. Yeah, those definitions are there. They're not absolutely necessary, but they are the statutory definitions of the different classifications of cannabis okay uh 
type businesses and um, just we're just trying to be crystal clear that this ordinance only applies to cannabis retailers okay. as opposed to those other forms of cannabis businesses. That, thank you. I appreciate it. It makes sense. Yeah, because the one the section, you know, three A clearly states that, right? And I was just I was looking for the tie back to some of the definitions. So thank you. Yeah. And then the hemp and part. The yeah. reference to hemp is to make it clear. Uh, hemp is a form of cannabis, mm -hmm. and we want to make it clear that this ordinance does not apply to hemp. It only applies to uh, cannabis containing THC. Okay. Yeah, there was a big Got it. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate yeah. that clarification. Um, You're welcome. So yes. I think, oh, will oh. this draft be posted anywhere outside of the agenda for residents? Yes, see? yes. Um, so we um, will leave it with the clerk's office. Um, and I believe when we send out the legal notice, we usually accompany the legal notice um, with the full draft ordinance oh, as perfect. well. Great. Yeah. And we will update the packet online to make sure that this is included. In fact, I think Tom might have done that already today. So yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I think that's the end of our regular agenda, and we're going to go into executive session with um, Bob D. Crescenzo, Tom Roy. I think Tom's going to stay. Mal you, Maria. Yes. Melissa. Melissa's not staying. Melissa will not stay this okay, evening. Okay. So with, we're, we'll um, I ask to make a motion to move to executive session with those people. Move that. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay.